Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, or good night, wherever you are. My name is Anton Kruger, and I'm presenting a class for Drama 2, Drama Department at Rhodes University during our lockdown experience. Uh, you might not have seen me around much this year. I've been on sabbatical. I've been researching improv and mindfulness and creativity and all kinds of really fun things like that, doing workshops and researching and reading. And so um, I'm just here to do kind of a little guest spot or just helping out to do a one-off class about um, the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the theater that emerged out of it. And also the performative aspects of the TRC as a kind of uh, performative engagement as well, and a way of telling story or trying to create a, a narrative of South Africa. This is very weird for me. It's the first time ever that I'm doing this, just talking to a blank screen, not having the class in front of me. <clears throat> I remember most of you, I think, from last year. Adile, how's it going? Back there. It's uh, odd to not be able to uh, see how you're responding or asking questions or asking you questions. Um, that's a lot of the engagement in the class comes out of that. So it's like very odd for me to be presenting a little bit like a news reporter here. It feels strange, but I'm sure it feels strange for you as well to be sitting out there in your pajamas or whatever, who knows what you're doing as you're watching this, busy rolling yourself a little uh, cigarette there and checking in on your morning class. But I hope you're all uh, keeping safe and that you're all well and that we can all get together again soon enough. All right, so that's what's happening here. Drama 2, TRC, SA Theatre. Let's do it. So on Are You Connected, there are quite a, a bunch of resources. Mainly there are three um, articles, or I've, I've put out three specific readings for you. And that's really the, <coughs> sorry, the, I guess the crux of the foundation of this um, lecture series. I do tend to go on tangents and ramble a bit and talk about this and that. But the main thing to come back to, I think, and I'm going to be talking around those three um, texts. That's what you can come back to. If you want to prepare your, your exam question, come back to those texts. There are also some clips that you can check out on YouTube. We'll look at a few during this talk as well. Um, so, so there's a lot of material there, but the point I want to make is just, uh, if you're ever in doubt, just go back to the readings. The readings is where it's at. Um, and my talking to you now is a way to just talk a little bit around, introduce you to the readings and give you a way of looking at them. <clears throat> but do keep in mind, uh, the whole academic scholarly enterprise is thinking for yourself. So you don't necessarily have to agree with what you read. Your uh, argument that you're going to make in your exam essay will be looking at your ability to reason and put together and uh, persuade an argument, to think for yourself, to use your, your rationality and your reason, to draw on evidence, you know, to show why what you're saying is, is valid or why you feel the way you do or what you think is the case. So that's what it's about. It's not about me just telling you uh, what to think. This is how it is. Not at all. It's about you looking at the evidence, looking at the material, looking at the plays and coming up with some kind of a response from yourself about what you think and how you feel about it. It's, it's, it's kind of weird being in this uh, creative arts department because creativity especially that I'm now kind of researching it this year, it really flourishes most when there isn't any uh, critique or criticism. You know what I mean? Like, I like uh, to be inspired by an idea. You need, you don't want to be thinking, uh, am I right or wrong? Or is this good or bad? Or am I better or worse? <clears throat> Those kind of things. But unfortunately, in the scholarly kind of thing that we're doing here, it is a little bit about critique, I suppose. It's about refining an argument and going, this is a better argument than that. And um, so that's unfortunately a little bit about what we're in. Although you, you can also be inspired, sure. Academic writing doesn't have to be totally boring and bland. You can also have an inspired argument and have a moment where you go, hey, wait a minute, 
geez, that's like an incredible idea. Maybe I'm the first person to have this idea. So don't um, put that aside either. Don't dull your uh, creative faculties because we're engaged in a critical exercise here. And a controversial one. I mean, the TRC, there is a lot of critique coming up these days about it, that it was a flawed process, that people were not brought to book, that we still suffering the repercussions of the way it was handled. So we're going to not ignore those, that argument or that side of things either. So basically, um, what I want to do <coughs> is we're going to look at what the TRC was. I'm sure you're familiar with it. I mean, surely they're teaching you this stuff at school these days. It must be a big part of the curriculum. It's a seminal moment in South African history. So, but we'll, we'll go over the basics. What was it? What was it trying to do? What were the aims? And then we're going to look at the, um, well, specifically as a, as a form of storytelling, as a kind of uh, Jabelu Ndebele talks about the TRC as a, a way of narrativizing the identity of the country. The whole country never before was an attempt made by, I don't think it was any country, in quite the same way to tell the story of itself. To, to come together and to, to recreate itself through narrative. So I want to look a little bit at that, the idea of creating a, a nation or forging a nation or forging an, a national identity through telling a multiplicity of different stories. That's kind of the one point we want to make. And then we're going to look at three plays. And not in huge detail, there isn't really time, but we're going to just touch on three plays. There were many, many plays and productions that came out of the TRC. It was really a definitive moment in South African theater before people were saying, what are we going to write about? That it was before that, that it was um, protest theater, anti-apartheid theater. It was clear. What are the aims? What are the goals? What are we doing? How are we going about it? After 94, after democracy, when Mandela became the first uh, president or first democratically elected president, there was this impasse, what are we going to do now? And in some way, the TRC was this opportunity of, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to, this is what's important. This is what's relevant. This is what we're going to make theater about. So it was this definitive moment in the mid-90s there, mid to late 90s, of South African performance coming into its own, again, post-anti-apartheid theater. So... We look at it a bit in that way as well. And then we look at these, the, the three particular productions that we're going to look at are the story I'm about to tell, by, uh, well, created by the Kulumani support group. Scripts was Lesejo Rampola King, along with um, the participants, the stories that were being told. The story I'm about to tell, then we're going to look at Ubu and the Truth Commission. Maybe you're familiar with it from English or arts or other disciplines. Uh, William Kentridge and Jane Taylor. And then we're going to look at uh, Truth in Translation, a production about the translators at the commission and their job of embodying and passing on the messages, kind of the messages that were passing through them from the perpetrators and the victims. They had to, to embody and speak in the, in the first person from both those sides. Maybe the story I'm about to tell really specifically focuses on the victims on the people to whom terrible things were done, their stories. Ubu and the Truth Commission has as its main protagonist one of the perpetrators, or this cartoonish, galumphing figure, uh, making fun of or ridiculing a little bit uh, an agent of the apartheid state. And then the, so that there's a, it also tells the stories as well um, from the victim's perspective, but, it, but there is the, one of the main characters is a, a perpetrator, a, um, uh, police chief army authoritarian figure involved very much in the torture and the killing. So that's another perspective. And then the third one is the truth in translation about the translators. So there's, that's also a, a good range of where to put the focus or where people put the focus when they're told these stories. <clears throat> so in some way, that's why we, we're going to bring those three together. I'll we'll say just a little bit about each one and what made each one uh, unique, what made it a theatrical engaging form, what were some critiques that came up, what were some questions that were raised, all of that as well. So that's really what this uh, lecture is about, what we're going to be doing here. 
So let's start at um, the readings that I've given you. I want to also remind you, I'm going to put this up on YouTube so you can download it. And there is a, uh, those of you that are uh, data wary or conscious, be, there is a way, I'm sure you're aware, to, to download YouTube clips with very low data, data saver. That's literally like, um, like 20 megabytes for an hour. I'm kind of making that up now. I can't remember exactly. But I mean, I noticed that when I was low on data, so there is a way to so be, to be sure if you are, that might, might be the easiest way for you to, to, re, to record this. If you want to download this YouTube clip with data, the data saver, this was on the phone app, the YouTube phone app or YouTube go, um, that you can do that, that really you can, you can, you can download this clip with very low data. I wanted to just mention that goodness, where are my notes now? So the first two chapters, that I've given you, they come from a book that I wrote called uh, it's Experiments in Freedom, Explorations of Identity in New South African Drama. There it is, Experiments in Freedom. This was published 10 years ago, already a decade old, <coughs> even a bit older than that. It was my PhD thesis, which was finished in 2007, 2008. So that's also uh, relevant to take into account uh, when it was written. But basically, it's about the search for identity in New South African theatre and coming from this point of view that, um, as I was saying, you know, South African theatre was, was world-renowned during the apartheid era for being anti-apartheid. And uh, there was a very clear message. You were either for or against the state, the regime, and, uh, and, and, and South African theatre became famous worldwide for taking this stance and the theatres like the Space in Cape Town and the Market Theatre in Joburg, uh, independent theatres were put on the map because they were doing productions that were critiquing and attacking the state, but also showing the conditions of people living under apartheid. So this is now chapter 14 that I've given you, post-anti-apartheid theater. It starts off with a, a, a little um, epigram from an essay called Learning to Live Without the Enemy. Um, maybe I'll read it. After 1994, the enemy was all of a sudden gone. Apartheid and violence made for powerful images, poignant stories, Stirring poems, heart-stopping film, can we learn to create again without the enemy? So <clears throat> this was kind of the big question in the mid-90s in South African theater. A lot of the impetus, the raison d'etre of the theater was uh, a little bit limp with this, without this um, obvious enemy to attack. I mean, to attack an enemy is, is one of the most powerful ways of creating an identity isn't it? It's us and them. You create an identity often with other people. You form a bond because we're both against that. You know, that's almost the easiest way in which you can create a connection with people. Um, a little bit off topic, but there was a great quote from uh, George Bush, I remember from the late 90s, before 9-11, before when American um, identity also was a little bit in flux because they'd had the Cold War, they'd been anti-communist and an anti-Soviet Union for so many decades, and then suddenly, with the opening up of the, you know the whole world changed in the early 90s. Not only in South Africa, you know the Soviet bloc fell away, dictatorships in South America crumbled or changed or became democratic. So there was a huge shift towards democracy worldwide around about that time. So there was a thing about American identity because there was no Soviet Union to be the enemy anymore. And there was this bizarre and kind of funny and weird quote from George Bush around that time where he said, uh, we don't know, uh, something like, I'm paraphrasing, we don't know who they are. Like when I was growing up, but that's how it starts. He says, when I was growing up, uh, we knew who they were, the commies and the, you know, the, we knew who they were. Now we don't know who they are, uh, but we know they're out there. So it's like this weird thing of 
We don't know who they are, but we know they're there. Them. This is the epigram of a book by John Ronson called Them. So it's about people like who is they? Who is these like global elite? Who are these? It's like a conspiracy theory kind of thing. Who is them? So this was just before 9-11. And then with 9-11, of course, then uh, Bush and America found an enemy. Okay, it's, it's, it's these guys. Okay, tangent. Back to the topic. So no enemy. What's the identity and what's happening in and theater and expressive arts and so on. <clears throat> um, there's a couple of, uh, Lauren Kruger, Lauren Kruger wrote a definitive book on South African theater. It was recently updated, came out last year. I think it's called A Century of South African Drama. I did a review of it in the South African Theater Journal, if you're interested. But she was the one who came up with this, this term, post-anti-apartheid theater. Post-anti-apartheid, so it's not quite post-apartheid, because it's like, well, apartheid is still kind of around. The 90s, not much has changed, so it's different. But post anti apartheid theater, so theater that is anti apartheid, it's moving beyond that for many reasons. Also, because um, people that were still making plays uh, uh, focused on the apartheid era, there wasn't much urgency and there wasn't much, um, it was quite safe. In, in some way, in the 80s and the 70s and the 60s, you were making plays against this government that had a secret service, that had police who were checking you in the audience that could just take you and uh, without trial, with the detention without trial, you could just be disappeared, you could go into house arrest. Terrible things could happen to you if you fell foul. But now in democracy, to come out and critique and say, what, 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 there wasn't really any urgency. So that, that urgency or danger or element of telling the truth in the face of some serious threat uh, wasn't there anymore. One of the things. At the, so the, talk a bit about <coughs> moments of transition and transformation in national identities and in societies. And if we think about a performance in societies, societies from a family unit up to an extended family or a, or a village or a group or a town, or, you know, we get, or, or, or online identities, groups of people. The two forms of performance in South Africa, probably worldwide, that make the most amount of income, I think, uh, and, and, and take the most amount of effort are marriages and funerals. If you think about how many people are involved? Uh, creative people, creative arts people, or you know, in, in, in weddings, you've got the caterers, and you've got the dressmakers, and you've got musicians often playing, you've got people that design the ceremony. It's a, it's a social performance, enacting a symbolic, uh, really important uh, action, and a lot of money is spent on it. So, uh, we've got weddings and funerals are the two big kind of social events, social performative events that. Um, Pretty much every culture has, we're all familiar with the, the rites and the rituals and the performance elements behind them. So I was wondering about in a larger society or, or, or a country, how do we, I mean, if you think back to your Aristotle and Shakespeare and so on, and what you probably learned at school, that um, tragedy is about death or tragedy ends in death and comedy ends in marriage those two big things. Either there's a union, a celebration, a coming together, or there's a letting go, a sorrow, an acknowledgement of uh, the past being over and a saying goodbye. So marriages and funerals are the, stay with me here, I know this is a little bit of a roundabout way. Marriages and funerals are two big social events that uh, bind a society, a community together. Uh, how would this be played out in performance on a more formal stage, in moments of transformation? Both of these forms can be used. If we think about the inauguration of Nelson Mandela, 10th of May, 1994, it was like a marriage. It was like a celebration, all the different cultures represented. Lauren Kruger has a whole chapter about this, about pageantry and the performance of nationhood. And so there was a kind of a joyful, happy coming together, finding unity, finding common ground amidst uh, difference and diversity, and looking for some kind of uh, unity, some Ubuntu, some way of working together. So there's the marriage, but there's also the, the funeral. 
I think was maybe more like the, the TRC, which was like the, the mourning, the, the heartache, the crying, the acknowledgement of loss, of lack, not trying to push aside real trauma and pain that had been experienced. And um, yeah, talking about it, bringing, bringing it out into the open. We know what it's, you know, you know the, if, you, if you've experienced a traumatic event, the best thing you can do, they say, is to, to tell somebody about it, who is a sympathetic, who, is, who doesn't judge you, who um, you know, doesn't re-victimize you, but is actually supportive and creates a safe space for you to tell what happened. So the, I think the TRC in some way was performing this role of mourning, of, of, of trying to heal by telling the story, by telling what happened. It was quite um, unique in a sense. Because, I mean, the, um, okay, let's get more to the, I'm going to stick more to the chapter and we get to the TRC. Well, okay, let me just say, yeah, what, what was really unique about it that um, I don't think it's ever happened in any other country before there were hearings in Chile um, after, their, after Pinochet and the dictator and the regime there, but they were held in camera. They were held in private, so they weren't publicly available. People couldn't see what people were talking about. It was all kind of secrets and decisions were made. So this is the first really absolutely open public space <coughs> televised. The television program called Special Report that televised the TRC was the most watched media event in, in the history of Africa. It's never so many viewers every single week for three years, they saw the TRC playing out on television. I'll show you the very first clip from that in just a second. And it was also um, interesting or different or part of its, its makeup was that it wasn't a kind of court of law. There wasn't, there weren't, there were uh, amnesty. A lot of amnesty was granted. They, 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 a lot of, they said, if you told everything, then you will get amnesty. So a lot of people were not punished. They did not go to jail. Then some people did, uh, like Eugene de Kock, the um, guy who was known as Prime Evil, I mean, geez, what a, what a name. I was just thinking, imagine working for this guy. You'd have to be kind of suspicious if you think your boss's nickname is Prime Evil. Like, what are you doing here? Working for Prime Evil. That was his nickname, like, amongst his, his colleagues. Jeez. But okay, so he got like two life sentences and whatever. So some people were sentenced, but majority of cases, um, people did not, they were, they were given amnesty for full confession. If they told the full story, they were then granted a degree of amnesty because it was seen as the priority was in what's the truth. We want to hear the story and we want to bring together the perpetrators and the victims to know what really happened and to allow also the, to, 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 to the victims to tell their story from their side, what they experienced, and for the people who did what they did to, to really see <coughs> the effect that they had. It wasn't just an abstract business they were engaged in. They weren't just fighting communism or preserving the integrity of the state or whatever they had been told, what their function was in a sort of intellectual way, but to actually see real people, real pain, real trauma, real suffering that they had been responsible for, that they had caused. So that was the, the aim of it. It wasn't kind of vengeance, let's get the people who did the wrong things which now people are critiquing and saying maybe there should have been more uh, justice. There should have been more people uh, sent to, to jail, prison sentences and so forth, and less um, amnesty. There was, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of restorative justice. This is a concept, I know in New Zealand they've got this system where they try to focus um, or bring in an element uh, not only to see justice as punishment, as, okay, we must hurt the people who hurt other people, but to restore somehow their um, hum humanity or their, because they, they we see them also as, as blunted, uh, 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 misshapen or, or emotionally stunted, something, you know, there's something missing, something lacking. So what they do is bringing seen as a priority to bring together you know if somebody somebody was a burglar and they burgled a house and they kind of in their mind they just think oh well they've got insurance or who cares these are rich people but then they put them together with the victims 
people that were traumatized by what they had done, people who they hurt, and to see the suffering that they caused. And in some way, that is part of the process of justice for them to really acknowledge and to see what, to, to face the truth of what, of what they did. So I think this was, there was an exercise in restorative justice rather than whatever the other kind would be. Retributive, I think it's called, where retribution, retributive justice, where you, you want retribution for things that were wronged, you must pay, pay the price, pay in pain for pain you caused, kind of thing. Um, okay, so I kind of jumped a little bit now <coughs> from the, uh, this is actually chapter 15 now, talking about the TRC setup. And just to go back a step to chapter 14. Um, oh, sorry about this. I'm kind of like vroom, going backwards now. I was talking about the, the, the grand narrative idea of anti-apartheid theater, where things were very clear, very clear cut, us and them, good, bad, black, white, perpetrators, victims, and so forth. And then after 94, how those kinds of plays and that kind of way of thinking wasn't as viable anymore because now the situation has ostensibly changed. There's a, a black African elected, democratically elected president um, and things are in transition. Um, so do you know what a grand narrative is? Put up your hand if you know what a grand narrative is. Come on. So uh, the term grand narrative comes from this French uh, philosopher, Jean-Francois Lyotard, in the famous book he wrote called The Postmodern Condition from the 1970s. And he talked about, a, I don't know if he defined the term, but he uses this term grand narrative as an overarching story, one big story that subsumes and that defines all the other little stories. <clears throat> Do you know what I mean? It's like a, being defined by one big story. And he t talks about the postmodern condition, which he says is the age that we are or were or, or moving or living in beyond modernism, as an incredulity towards meta-narratives. Meta-narrative is like a grand narrative. Yeah? It's a story about all the stories together. One story that tells all the stories. Whereas he is, is, is kind of talking about micro stories, little stories, multiplicity, plurality, having uh, many stories if you want to get to truth and experience and the nature of subjective experience. Preferring many stories to one single story. Uh, some of you might be familiar with this quite famous um, TED talk by um, Chimamanda Adichie. Uh, maybe, I don't know, can you see that? The danger of a single story. Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie from Nigeria, a novelist, talking about, I mean, it's quite old. I'm sure you've come across it in other subjects. But what happens when there's only one story that's defining you and telling you this is who you are, this is where you come from, this is your place, your role. And she talks about, I don't, we don't really have time to look at it. I just wanted to let you know about it. So I can share the link. But the danger of a single story. So apartheid in some way was a single story. It was, this is the story that is so powerful and it's so invasive <clears throat> and its tentacles were in, in land ownership and in who you were allowed to have sex with or who you were allowed to marry or who you were allowed to, you know what I'm talking about. I don't have to go into the whole thing. It was really an all encompassing story about this is the way things are. And there was the danger that anti-apartheid also became a very single story that just all of that is wrong. So attacking all of that is right, which is true, but also narrow. It also kind of, it, it becomes, you only become able to express your, your, your self, your reality in terms of opposition to that thing. You know what I mean? There's a danger in that. Um, so I wanted to just indicate there's a couple of, pages we can skip over here. Um, so also the theater that was opposing apartheid, people looked at it quite uncritically in terms of quality and in terms of what it was saying and how it was saying it because it was so obviously the right thing, the right moral position. 
the right moral standpoint. This is on page 95. Ian Stedman points out, <coughs> because apartheid provided such an easy moral target, many people supported anti-apartheid theater regardless of its quality. And he warns that, or at least in the, in the 90s now when things were changing, that uh, to abandon critical vigilance about what are we watching, who's telling the story, how they're telling the story. Now we don't have to be critical anymore because the right people are in charge, the ANC has come to power, now we've got the right story, now we have the true story, now we have the only story. So what he was pointing out here is that um, even in this post-apartheid condition, we must remain vigilant. If we abandon critical vigilance at this crucial moment, we lose the war against fundamentalism, against essentialism, and against nationalism and racism. So quite strong words there, that's page 95, and he's, and he's writing this in the middle of the 90s, um, saying that we must still be vigilant of the powers that be and who's in charge and who's telling the story and still prefer many stories over one story. So, okay, so I think the point I'm trying to make here is a bunch of other stuff you can look at if you want to, but that the TRC, and all this proliferation of media and literature and drama and all these things that came out of it, the many books and plays, um, was this kind of attempt. It was an attempt to tell many stories and, and for people to tell their own stories, individual stories, <clears throat> not kind of just big abstract stories about the whole people or about the whole country or the whole ideology but individual, personal, subjective stories that were experienced by human beings. So that was the part of the value and why it was such a crucial uh, performative moment in the history of South African theater. So that does chapter 14. I'm recording this on Zoom, but I can't really see how long I'm going. I feel like I'm talking too long, but maybe I'll cut it up into smaller uh, chunks rather than one big um, uh, lecture series. Let's, let's finish off at least uh, the introduction to the TRC and maybe I'll only get to the plays in the next episode then. But uh, so I already gave you some intro there about this extraordinary um, unique, the uniqueness of it, the fact that this, this actually was possible. <clears throat> and yes, it was flawed for many reasons. Uh, not the, the, the apartheid generals were not forced to testify. P.W. Boerter, the great crocodile himself, who was kind of the arch nemesis in the 80s, of it was only because he had a heart attack and, and was accidentally taken out of power that F.W. de Klerk was able to move in and, and shift things around because P.W. wasn't going to change anything. He was absolutely hardline, he, had, he was unrepentant, um, really. Uh, the apartheid, he epitomized the apartheid ideology. So P.W. Boerter, and I was shocked to, to read this, I kind of didn't know, I'd forgotten, that uh, he, he never testified. He was called to testify, and I think they even subpoenaed him, and he just said, oh, no, thank you, I'm not, I don't think so, I'm not going to do that. So he never did. So he never appeared at the TRC. And he just sort of went his way, he retired, he died in his sleep in the early 2000s, and nothing came of it. So that was like quite a shocker to actually to read that. So, okay, many flaws, but still an extraordinary attempt, just the idea, the vision of this project, to at least try it, to try to have this public telling of stories and to have the, both the perpetrators and the victims in one room saying, what happened? What is the truth? How do we get to the truth of what really happened? We need to also remember, I mean, there are different uh, kinds of truth. There's the factual data, empirical stuff, <clears throat> but there's also the experiential truth. And many of the people who suffered uh, under apartheid from the security police and, uh, and all the rest of it, the, the laws, um, or particularly the traumatic events, the, the murder and, and rape and brutality and killing, uh, real trauma and, and, and what trauma does to your emotional memory and your psyche is it, it, it fragments it. It's not clear. So the truth telling the memory is also fragmented. It's not always a clean line. So sometimes the, the story from the perpetrator was more of a um, 
clean linear story because they had their instructions they did this they did this they did this they did this so they, it's like a nice story or, well not you know what i mean not nice it's, it's it's an outline of a story whereas the effect of the victim who was suddenly traumatically shocked surprised by this intrusion by a, a bomb a letter bomb going off or somebody banging on their on their house in the middle of the night and carting off their kid um the memory is fragmented. It's not clear always. So we'll see how this, the, the, this is also reflected in the plays that come out of this. How do we reflect trauma? How do we reflect this fragmentary nature of traumatic experience? I'm jumping ahead again. Sorry, man. This is what I do. I've got all these papers here, but we'll get there. We'll get there. Uh, yeah. Remember, get back to the, the, the text is what's uh, rooting it. Um, so the TRC. Let's uh, let me give you this um, quote here from. This is at the beginning of chapter fifteen. <clears throat> Perhaps no country in history has so directly and thoroughly confronted its past in an effort to shape its future as South Africa has working from the explicit assumption that understanding the past will contribute to a more peaceful and democratic future. South Africa has attempted to come to terms with its apartheid history through its Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So quite a bold claim, no country in history. That's like a long time history, and that's a lot of countries. <laughs> so, no, so it's quite a bold statement to make. No country in history has tried to just confront its past and to shape its, its future working with this idea that if you understand, if you reconcile, if you see, this is going to help people uh, come to terms with what happened. So I mentioned also this, um, Jabulo Ndebele is talking about the TRC as a restoration of narrative, not just um, justice and truth, but narrative a restoration of narrative and he goes on to say few countries in the contemporary world do have a living example of people reinventing themselves through narrative <clears throat> so this was the project to reinvent a national identity in a symbolic way through storytelling through telling the story of what happened and through listening through empathic listening and and telling the interim i'm on page 100 here of chapter 15 the interim constitution, before there was a period in between the regimes, the interregnum, where um, the, the final constitution hadn't been ratified, and there was an interim constitution which set out what the TRC was going to try to do, or the aims of setting up the TRC. So uh, the interim constitution talked about the hearings as there is a need for understanding, but not for vengeance a need for reparation, but not for retaliation, a need for Ubuntu, but not for victimization. It was kind of part of the thing. So the, the aim of it was not for, not to get revenge, not to, you know, that, that retributive justice idea of hurt the people who hurt other people, but rather repair or reparation came out, but hopefully maybe that also hasn't been that successful, how to repair damages but how to heal and to create a common humanity. And, and this was also, I mean, we've got to remember <clears throat> this whole project is purely imaginary. It's an imagined community. Every country, I mean, what is a country if it's not something from the imagination? Huh? If we look down at the earth from space or from the sky, there's no borders. There's no natural countries there's no oh this is like a god-given line that's where this country start that nonsense it's it's an idea somebody came up with the idea let's make a country maybe a lot of countries start with an ethnic um, identity a unity a, a people that are founded on a religion or a language or a specific culture but today there's hardly there's no country like that anymore i was trying to think how how few um what you call homogenous. Homogenous is like country that's got one people, like, like maybe Japan 
is fairly homogenous. If you, I mean, I've been to Japan and you really stand out there. Everybody looks, oh, there's the Gaijin. You really can spot a foreigner a mile away, or anybody who's not Japanese, Japanese ethnic identity. You know what I'm saying? So there is some homogeneity there in some countries, but most countries, well, I'm trying to think now of the countries, but there are, but, but many, many countries are heterogeneous, huh? pluralistic, multicultural. There's, there's not, they don't have all the same religion. They don't all have the same political beliefs. They don't all have the same race or nationality. Or, well, they've got the same nationality, I suppose. But you know what I'm saying? There's like, it, 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 and, and how do we create an imaginary symbolic way of bringing people together <coughs> if you can't rely on, on things like markers, like race or religion? or a language or an ethnic identity or something like that how do you forge something in the imagination symbolically so the trc was also this imaginary symbolic uh, we can almost say fictional project the nation is also something fictional isn't it it's, it's something that's it's, it's a story it's, it's kind of made up and it's agreed by the various participants people agree okay we're going to call it this thing i mean think about our country South Africa. What kind of a name is that anyway? That's that's like a direction. It's not really a it's such an unoriginal name, actually, if you think about it. It's just this like okay, south of the continent. It's like a weird name. But somehow we imbue it with uh, meaning and you feel something for it, and you feel a connection to the people and the flag, and that's all in the mind. You know what I'm saying? Feeling as well is in the mind. If we say mind, body, mind, feeling, mind, emotion. <clears throat> I'm not saying it's intellectual, the connection. The, 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 it's, it's a real tie. There is a real emotional and social and psychological link. But it doesn't... Um, yeah, maybe the, I need to make the point that I'm not saying imaginary like it's something less. I'm not saying, oh, it's just imaginary. It's just fiction. It's just... And I'm not using the word it's just like that. These are powerful things, you know. Imagination is powerful. Who you think you are, who you think other people are, that's the power of your imagination. In the creative arts, expressive arts, it's all about uh, harnessing and cultivating and using the power of the imagination. That's what we're busy doing, you know. When we want to be creative, we want to learn how do we use this powerful resource of imagination. So I'm not saying it dismissively. I'm not saying, oh, the country, idea of a country is, is just a myth. Myths are powerful. Huh? Ideas are powerful. All right. Maybe that is another little tangent there. Let's get back to just setting out what the TRC was, what its aims were. So, okay. I already mentioned some of the difficulties with it, some of the problems. Um, they, they didn't have cross-examination because they didn't want to put somebody on the stand, like in a court of law. I think that was one of the reasons they didn't want to follow the purely legal route. Because you know what, it, uh, what lawyers are like and what court of law is like. There's somebody trying to prove you wrong. And if there's somebody who's had a traumatic experience, they've seen their, their child uh, torn apart by a bomb that assassinated them, and then you get some lawyer going, oh, but where were you at this time? And what were you? Da, 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 trying to put them on the spot and trying to, you know what I mean? That would be a very cynical way of trying to get to a truth. And why law is so problematic. It's not really about truth, is it? It's about an argument and just making an argument for a case, for a side. So they tried to avoid that by not having cross-examinations. But they did uh, examine the perpetrators. So, so the people that had committed um, offenses were examined and they did ask them, why didn't you do this? Why did you do that? So in some way, ironically, they almost had a bigger voice. They were talking, they got to say what was happening because of the circumstances of these investigations. So sometimes their stories had almost more agency than the stories of the victims. This is a, a curious paradoxical thing. Shane Graham, the other essay I gave you is by Shane Graham. It's quite a difficult one. It's, it's not an easy essay. I've got to tell you from Research in African Literatures. Yeah, that's on there for you. But I want to encourage you to give it a go. You know, it's a long essay. You don't have to read all of it. There's a whole bunch of stuff at the end about poetry. You've got to see what's valuable in an essay as well. You know, most of it is usually in the front. 
where they set out the thesis. This is what it's about. And there's a bunch of stuff there about um, Uber and the Truth Commission and story I'm about to tell. So we can tap into that a little bit, but I'm warning you, it's quite a, it's quite a tough one. It's at a high level of scholarly, it's like a journal, journal article stuff there. So this is a quote from that essay from Jane Graham, <clears throat> page 100. The I who tells the story never entirely equals the I to whom terrible things were done. For to tell a story requires agency, and the trauma victim is one who has experienced a loss of agency. So we unpack that a bit. The I who tells the story. So somebody, they, they're telling the story. This is what happened to me. But is it really the same? I think it's that thing about the different kinds of facts or truth. The I to whom things were done. The, the perpetrator says, I did this to that person. That's a kind of story. But the other story of I had this done to me and my entire world shattered. My whole frame of reference. I felt like I was going crazy. That's a, you know what I mean? That truth of that experience, that reality is different from one night in one policeman's um, career where he goes, oh, I had to go and do a job and I went and I did this job and I shot somebody. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm being a bit glib. I'm sure there's, it's not as, as hard and cold and fast as, as that. But you know what I'm saying? The, the, the eye to whom who tells the story is not quite the same as the eye to whom something is told. This is part of the problem. Um, another difficulty in this, uh, there's a quote here from Annelies Verdurlage. I don't know how to pronounce that right. Verdurlage. One of the problems is that there was, because it was a big media event, and I'm going to show you a clip of the very first episode of that special report, but she says, uh, inherent to the media as an institution, they, you get sensationalism, partiality, and simplification. So that's stuff we see all the time, especially these days on Facebook and YouTube. Simplification, you only see a little bit of the story, partial truth, and you see the most sensational part of it. You see the most dramatic, traumatic part of it. You don't always see the whole thing. Uh, also, she said, um, the media sensationalism tended to pay more attention to the perpetrators than to the victims, because the perpetrator stories were more actionful, I suppose, and more coherent as stories. So that was a problem that she identifies as well. All of this is kind of background. We're not even getting to the plays yet. And maybe this is uh, boring. Maybe you know this already. But let's, let's go through it anyway. Good thing with the YouTube, you can just like hit that play at double speed and have me talking in a high-pitched voice. Okay. She also does talk about the, the impact. The TRC was the most mediatized phenomenon of the 1990s, probably the most mediatized event ever in Africa. That was writing in 2005. Hopefully there's been some bigger events since then, but it was huge at the time. That's the point I'm making. I think you get the point I'm making. And out of this, a lot of theater emerged. Let me show you here just some of the, uh, the plays that came up out of the, the TRC. show you that. So these are just some of the plays that came out of the TRC. Mike van Graan's Dinner Talk, Peter Rukai's Truth the Missions, Paul Hertzberg's The Dead Weight, Walter Chekala's Isi Tuku Tuku, Nine Hamilton's Number Four, Uben the Truth Commission, That Spirit by Mina Nawe, Story I'm About to Tell by Kulumani Support Group, Tembi Charlie's Woman in Waiting, Aike Kroch, Warum is die wat voor toi toi, altijd so fit, Truth in Translation, so a lot of plays, a lot of scripts, a lot of performances coming out of, you can see those years, those are the years of the commission, 96, 97, 98, 99. And we're gonna look, as I said, at three of them. We're going to look at um, Story I'm About to Tell by Kulubani Support Group over there. We're gonna look at um, Uber and the Truth Commission, Kentridge and Jane Taylor. And we're gonna look at Truth in Translation, the most recent or 2006. So that's what we're going to be checking out in this series. Um, maybe I should kind of stop there before we get into the plays themselves. 
Um, let me end off by just showing you the, the very first episode of the very first hearing of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It's all available on YouTube now, 536 clips. If you want to see the whole thing, let's just look at the very first episode and maybe look at also, um, I'll, I'll show you two clips. I'll show you one of the very first episode. It's really quite, um, I've got to warn you though, we're talking in a kind of abstract intellectual way. So you might get a shock when we now get immersed in, this is actually what happened. These are the people telling their story. It's just a two minute clip. It's not very long. And maybe I'll show you another clip of how the TRC was set up. What were the different, what was the process what, and, and the aims. So I'll show you those two and we'll, we'll end with that for now. So let me just share this. Um, here we go. So this was the very first episode of the very first commission. Welcome to the first special report on the Truth Commission. The Commission's first hearings were held here in the East London Town Hall, and it's been a week of raw emotion. <laughs> We just heard on the door the police were banging with their guns and they kicking the door. And we all just jumped out. We didn't know what to do because there was no one else there. It was only the three of us. We heard the anguish of widows, of mothers, and of victims themselves telling tales of disappearances, of torture, murder, and of suffering. We listened to their pleas for more information on the circumstances of the crimes and the names of the perpetrators. We will tell their stories tonight. We'll also show you some of their testimony. But tonight we will also introduce you to a man who has murdered dozens of anti-apartheid activists. That we've brutalized. Okay, let's... Um... Yeah. It's harsh, eh? it's different to talk about it in this way and then to be reminded of the reality of it. I think maybe I'll, um, maybe we leave it there just with that reminder of the, the true stories being told. And I'll start the next episode with the, the clip about um, how the TRC was set up. And then we'll get into those three plays, story I'm about to tell, we'll win the Truth Commission. Okay. Look after yourselves, take a break, do a little exercise every day, do something creative every day, stay on top of things during the lockdown period. And I will talk to you in just a minute.